If you have your Bibles, when our series in John, turn with me to John chapter 5, and we're going to go on with uh, by grace through faith. Praise God. It is by his grace alone that we are saved and healed. Uh, It's our faith that responds to his sovereignty, and we are healed by his power. Amen? We've seen that over and over again. But let's read about this interesting guy that Jesus heals in John chapter 5. He's kind of pathetic in a way, if we look at it from one perspective, and yet he's got a reason to be that way in some other things. So John 5, let's begin at the uh, verse 1. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem, for a feast of the Jew for, of the Jews, um, it sounds like they're feasting on Jews, but that's not what it meant. It meant never mind. Verse two, very little humor there. Very little. Hang with me. Now there is in Jerusalem near the sheep gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Beth, uh, Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five colonnades. Here are a great number of disabled people used to lie: the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. Imagine this sight here by this pool, these people come into this place crippled, probably perhaps left there all day, unable to move. Imagine the, the feces, potentially, and the, the mess and the, the smell and the filth that, that is in that place, not being able to use the restroom, hundreds of people by this pool. And how many in your Bible have no verse 4? If you have an ESV or an NIV or, or actually about half a dozen other translations, there is no verse 4. Now, there's a good reason for this. The earliest, most reliable manuscripts that are out there actually don't have verse 4. And you'll find more than 40 places in the NIV and 49 and some other Bibles that don't have verse 4. And um, they're specifically affected in the NIV as well. And I know it's a popular version. And it's not bad necessarily. The NIV does put the scriptures in there. I remember when... When the NIV came years ago, Zondervan produced this, and people nicknamed it the nearly inspired version. How many remember that? I don't know if you, maybe not. I'm the only one. So anyway, but they do put the scripture in there. Sometimes they put at the bottom the newer versions of the NIV, not the TNIV. Just stay away from that one. If you get the today's new NIV, new international version, it changes the the um, masculine pronoun from uh, God to he from just God. So um, in other words you know, making it more gender-friendly. In other words, don't buy it. Um, uh, So anyway, it's not necessarily bad, and I want to get to the reason, but the reasons we have chapters and verses in our Bible anyway, a few few hundred, several hundred years ago, 1503, uh, and actually he died in in 1559. He wasn't very old, but Robert Stevens, a French guy in the 16th century, um, a printer in Paris, and he uh, divided the New Testament into verses. And so it's the reason that we have verses today and was the first to print the Bible into a standard number of verses in 1555. In 1560, the Geneva Bible, um, an English uh, uh, Bible, came out. And I actually have a... Pete, will you grab this here? This is uh, actually years ago, I was counseling a, a man who had some issues in his life. And just, if you would like to look at this, this is a 1585 page of a Geneva Bible that um, he gave to me, and it it came framed, but um, it's pretty interesting. So he's just going to carry that around. If you want to take a close look at it, Pete's just going to take his time, take your time. It's not going to bother me walking around. But what's so interesting about this is, is just the veracity of Scripture. And how beautifully that God preserves his word in and, and all things. And there are other translations that came from the Geneva Bible, of course. It predated the King James Version of the Bible. And, and so we, we also had the English Bible and, and, and all of those kind of things. But in verse 4, there is, it's a verse that doesn't appear to be in the original text. But the Bible, because of oral tradition and uh, things that were known about it um, where it was inserted in there and as a transitional statement based on what they knew. So the the Bible is a remarkable book, friends, with more than 14,000 Old Testament fragments and books and comparing them to the the recent discovery in the 19th century of the Dead Sea Scrolls and between 1946 and 1956, including 972 additional texts that all agree with the previously written documents. Amazing! God takes care of his word. 
His word is perfect. His word is good. That said, there's a good reason we have a descriptive in verse 4 from those that have the ESV and NIV. The scribes who added it bring clarity to the reason uh, of hundreds of people who are hanging around this pool. It says in verse 4, from time to time an angel of the Lord would come down and stir the waters. The first one to the pool after such a disturbance to be cured was cured of whatever disease he had. So we kind of get the picture of what's happening here. Then it continues on in the narrative. In verse number 5 it says, One who, has, uh, who had been there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Now that's an interesting question. I wonder why Jesus would pose such an interesting question. I wonder what happened to this guy that Jesus would ask something like this, do you want to get well? And then the implication is that maybe he doesn't want to get well. And, and, and we know this because of what happens later, and we're going to look at that. It might be harsh to say, but, but maybe some of us can identify with this guy. Maybe some of us can say, well, we like, well, can we say that? This guy has been in this situation for a long time. And there's reasons that people get this way. There's, there, there's a reasons that there's, there's hopelessness. There's kind of a chronic way about it. The first point I want to make about this is that hope is broken. Imagine being this way 38 years. So why would he believe anything could change? Until people have a reason to believe for change or healing, they have no reason to hope, right? If he's been this way such a long time, can you imagine having been in this condition and, and having suffered this way for so long, so why believe this snake oil salesman? But you know, the Bible tells us that without a vision, people perish. In fact, in Proverbs 13, 12, it says, hope that's deferred or, or put off makes the heart sick but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. So putting off hope can bring depression and, and heartlessness. And this is why Jesus came. That's the good news, right? So people would hear hope. That's the reason Christ came, to bring salvation and healing. And we're going to get to that. The second thing, he had become accustomed to the attention or rejection, or rejection or the attention, whichever order you want to put them. In verse uh, 14 and 15, the Bible says, Later Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. Stop sinning or something worse may happen? Does this mean that sin produces sickness and disease? Well, we know that it can. Does it mean that if you're sick that you have sin in your life every time? No. Maybe this guy just liked being sick. I mean, I couldn't imagine, but hopelessness can breed that mentality, right? And he could complain and moan all the time, perhaps, and, and get compassion from people. Maybe that's what was happening. I mean, we really don't know. I'm only speculating here. But Jesus simply asked, do you want to get well? You know this, right? I mean, you face this in, in those you work with or in your family, um, or even in yourself, when you ask them, do you want to change, or do you want things to be different, or do you want to be healed? Sometimes all we hear is excuses. Listen to this guy's response in verse number 7. He says, sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, it sounds like kind of a, yeah, yeah, a little bit. Of course, he has reason to be that way, right? And then he says, it says that someone else gets in the pool ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. At once the man was cured, he picked up his mat and walked. Now, some might be saying, oh, Pastor, aren't you kind of hard on this guy? You're being kind of tough on him if you think he's whining and moaning and complaining. And I mean, he, he's been this way his whole life, and, and he has no hope. And, and, and I understand, hold on, though, because Jesus... Doesn't ask, he doesn't ask for Jesus' help. He never does, not once. And Jesus confronts him later in the temple, and he says, stop sinning, right? In other words, Jesus knows there's something going on more than his physical condition. 
Come on now. Jesus knows, he has insight into this guy, that there's something more going on inside of him. Jesus understands him so well, like Jesus understands every single one of us. Just like God sees right through our bodies, into our very minds, into our intentions of the heart. The Bible says that God weighs the intentions of the heart. Jesus knows in this regard that he's actually being deceptive. And Jesus deals with him directly. Stop sinning. No one will help me. No one, everybody gets in the pool before me. Jesus knew that that was something else being said. He knew something else was going on. Thirdly, comfortable being a victim. Here he is, 38 years old, doing the same thing around the same complaining people in the same situation. And again, that's what happens. I mean, I have been sick before. You know what it's like when women are sick, they get up, clean the house, take care of the kids, send them off to school, work all day, come home. If a man gets sick, he's laying in bed and, oh, my big toe, it's just killing me. And the wife, she gets dinner together and she brings it to, it's like, serve me, put a thermometer in a cold rack, bring me the remote control and hot soup. I, I know that no other man here is like that. But this is sort of like a dog returning to its vomit situation. And, and he was comfortable being this victim. It could have been that being depressed, and I know all the time, and maybe you've been in this way, you've been in the house watching the news all the time these days. Everybody's watching the news. And we're watching this news and that news, and it gets depressing, right? And after a while, do you want to be healed? Come on. Do we want to be brought out of what the world's thinking and how they're angry and, and what's going on in the church and all this stuff? And we just, do you want to be healed? I'm paranoid. People are always saying terrible things about me. Well, stop listening to them. Try being a pastor. Good for you. People have you for lunch. I'm overweight. Food's a big deal. I love food. It's so delicious. But I eat too much and I eat the wrong things. Do you want to be healed? Oh, it gets quiet. I'm not happy with my spiritual condition. My one-minute daily devotions just aren't cutting it. Do you want to be healed? Jesus doesn't always heal the same way, right? At one point, he says, go your way. You're healed. Spit in the dirt. Makes mud. Put it in the guy's eye. I mean, I feel like a spit in your eye. I mean, come here. How's that? Healed, right? He got, Jesus, you know, even healed Peter's mother-in-law. A, a blessing I'm not sure he would have asked for. I, I just don't. I'm glad he would heal my mother-in-law, but I don't know about Peter's intentions. I'm just saying now. It's not very funny, I know. Don't throw things at me. But, you know, there's different ways in different circumstances that Jesus heals in every time. Does Jesus heal the same way every time? No, I've prayed for people. On in the hospital, many times I've, I've held their hand and prayed in Jesus' name. We trust you, God. We believe that you are healer. And we pray right now. And we are trusting you. We believe, Lord, and that, that you are going to touch and you are going to minister by your power according to your will. And I've seen people healed. I've seen it take longer in some situations. But I've seen them healed. We have all prayed for people on the prayer page, on our on our prayer page, and, and you lift them up in prayer, and, and the testimony may come back that they're healed, or we've prayed for Phil's a grandson, and he's come to Christ. What a glorious thing, but it doesn't happen the same way. It's not like you were there to lay hands on them, and let me prepare you this morning. We're going to do that this morning. We're going to lay hands on people that want to be prayed for. I've got the hand sanitizer right here, and between each person, I'm just going to pray. I'm going to put my mask on, and Pete's going to put his mask on. We're going to use this. We're going to be careful but we're going to pray. We're going to trust God because he tells us to, and we're getting there. I'm getting ahead of myself, so I don't want to do that. But why does God heal? Have you ever really thought about it? What does really the Bible say why he heals? This is important with doctrine because some in different movements in our in charismania don't believe this, but this is true. Number one, God heals to reveal, first of all, his glory. John 9, 2, and 3, they come to Jesus. They said, 
This guy's blind, Jesus. That's terrible. Who sinned? This man or his mother, his parents? Did they sin? And Jesus says, who sinned? Neither sinned, right? So what does he say? He says, neither sinned, but so that the glory of God might be revealed in him. And he heals him, right? So he's healed, not because he has great faith or anything, but because Jesus said the reason I'm healing him is so that God's glory is going to be revealed through him. Joni Erickson Tata's testimony is incredibly powerful. And, and her the diving incident and as a young person and she became paralyzed and, and here she is all these years later telling about the goodness of God. Why is she like that? Does she not believe that God can heal her? Of course she does. But God's glory is being revealed through her. Even in that quadriplegic state, thousands of people have been inspired and many come to Christ because of her story. Why? Number one, because God will reveal his glory. Exodus 4.11 even says, God says this, God says, who made man deaf or mute? Or who gives sight or makes them blind? In other words, I'm the one. Come on now. God, in his sovereignty, a very important biblical doctrine, knows and does as he wills. Secondly, why does God heal? Because he's a loving father. Matthew 14, 14, uh, when he went ashore, a large crowd comes. And what the Bible says? He has compassion on them. God is so much more loving than I. I sometimes I, I, you know, will catch different glimpses. There's somebody be playing a sermon I preached and said, you know, that's true, but it really doesn't sound very loving. <laughs> I better be careful the way I talk. But Jesus had compassion. He spoke with compassion. He was moved. In, in a couple other instances in Scripture, he sees the crowd and he's moved with compassion. Why does God heal? Because he's a loving father. And thirdly, he heals to draw people to salvation. We skipped over it, but just prior to the man here being healed at the pool, something we were going to preach on a couple weeks ago, I added it in here. There's a healing of the nobleman's son, right? So he believed because of the healing. Jesus healed and then he went his way, and the Bible says his whole house believed in Jesus. Friends, the reason Jesus healed this man's son and was so powerful was so his family would be saved. Salvation is the miracle. Salvation is realizing the gravity of an eternity without Christ, and it's a frightening idea. Can you imagine the realities of hell being suffered by everyone that you know and love? People are suffering. I had two conversations this week. One with a young man at a job site. And as I was speaking with him, he used to attend church, and now he's, you know, living with his girlfriend and doing all these other things. And I could tell as I was talking to him that he was feeling convicted about what he was doing in life and how he had moved away from the Lord. And I was able to interject hope and that, that, that Christ is Redeemer and Savior and in different ways of words but that there's nothing you've ever done where you've gone too far, where you've walked away from the endless grace of God. Every Sunday morning, just about every Sunday morning, there's a particular restaurant that I go to for breakfast. And I learned this because, you know, it wasn't that long ago I fainted on the platform. <laughs> I learned that I have to eat breakfast. It's something if I exert myself or do something and I find, unfortunately, my doctor says, you exert yourself when you preach. I watch you. And you just can't not eat breakfast. So, anyway. So I've been eating breakfast, and it's been better for me, right? It's the way God is healing me. We'll get there in a minute. So I'm at breakfast this morning. I'm talking to this, the waitress, and I know her fairly well, see her often. And as she's bringing my food, she knows my order. Uh, for Sundays, it's different than when I go out with Pam. So I don't want Pam to... Hey, Pam's in the room. I, I just said that was wrong. I'm sitting there, and she comes up, and I, I said, you know, I'm doing these interviews for the Identity Project, and I'm interviewing people, and it's, a, it, it's just about you. It's, it's not anything else, and I've interviewed a few people. We got them. We're going to make a book out of it here, hopefully, middle of next year. It'll be done. Who knows? I said, I'd really like to have your story. I didn't know what her story was. Well, she just opened right up. 
I sat there in awe as she talked about how her son was murdered. A man that had beat him up to a pulp the night before and he had been in the he had been in the emergency room and the man was arrested. Somehow he had gotten out and he was at home and this guy came in and he shot her son and this other young man. And you you can tell that she talked about going through the trial process and working with the lawyers. And I was just sitting there dumbfounded at her pain. People are hurting. And you have the hope of Christ. You are a listening ear. You don't have to preach at them in those moments. That was not my opportunity to preach. It was to listen. Start the conversation. Anyway, God heals. He heals to draw people to salvation. That's why he did it for this centurion or, or this uh, nobleman's son. And Jesus always does what he does and says what he says and heals the way he heals for ultimately salvation. Why do we get sick then? I, I was doing some research this week and there's a number of reasons that people get sick and I just want to point them out. If we are to be healed, the Bible has solutions for healing that counter the ideas and the ways that we get sick in this world. Well, what are the ways that we get sick? Well, number one on the list uh, by nutritionists and doctors is stress. We get sick because of stress is the number one reason for doctor visits today. I did not know this. Or stress-related illnesses, I should say, which adds a whole plethora of categories. I mean, stress is the number one reason for prescribed medications. I did not know that either. Fascinating. And God didn't, friends, design your body to operate under the kinds of stresses we put on. I remember, I think it was earlier this year or late last year, we preached on the Sabbath's rest. And all of us, a number of comments from that message, like, you know, I never realized that it was like a carryover into the New Testament. Well, God never changes. It's not that, you know, Saturday is the Sabbath that we always take. But wherever you can find rest, make sure you rest. You turn off your phone. You get away. You do something where you're just doing nothing. And we don't do that in our country. And what happens is, is we have debt, and then there's nothing more stressful than being maxed out or overspent on our budget. And I see young families do this all the time. They borrow money for this. They get a bigger that and a more expensive this. And after a while, they're so maxed out, there's this pressure. And it's so exhausting, right? And here's the truth about stress. Stress is our doing and our choice. When I was younger as a kid, I, I was rarely sick. In fact, I had never gone to the doctor ever in my life except for a physical for, to do sports in school, basketball specifically. And what, um, it wasn't until Pam and I got married and I had never seen the doctor for anything. And she kind of marveled at that. And I was working carpenter work, falling off roofs, you know, cutting my hand all the time, just wrapping. I didn't know you get go get stitches for that kind of stuff, uh, going to college, enjoying life. I was just, you know, having a good time. I was a young person. And it wasn't until I became a pastor <laughs> and, and, you know, people and what did I do instead of taking time to rest and wait on the Lord with every situation, I took it personally. I don't take it personally anymore. If I say what's true from God's word, I just stand behind it and I, I love people and, and it doesn't matter what they throw. But So I complained to God and I said, God, you said... Your yoke is easy, and your burden is light. He said, yeah, but it's not my yoke or my burden. Talk about getting gobsmacked. Now, let me tell you the truth, friends, in love. We need to understand that less is more. His burden is easy. His yoke is easy. Our burdens are great. We, we get stressed out. We have too much work, too much debt, too many things going on. We eat bad and think about too many things besides the goodness of God. And something else, the smallest things, set us off, right? Because we're already maxed out. We're maxed out so much. The next thing is just the straw that breaks the camel's back. And, and something else, that, that, that I think we need to know your kids will bug you. 
your ministry, your spouse will be more obnoxious, maybe, if they aren't already, I don't know. I see, you know, elbows going on, maybe. Your work will bug you at the smallest thing. Everything will be a pain or difficult thing that you do, especially things that you try to enjoy. You'll sit at dinner like I have, and I regret this. Sit at dinner with my family, and they're laughing and going on, and I'm sitting there barely interacting because my brain has been so full of stuff that I can't function on that enjoyment level. It's just wrong, friends. Stress is things that we do. Now, I'm not saying we don't have problems in life, but more often than not, we compile it. Number two, I was very interested to find out food. <laughs> you know, this one dietitian, they, they all agree, but one guy wrote this in, from the article for American Digest or American Dietitian or something. If you tell me what, you tell me what you eat, I'll tell you how you will get sick and probably how you will die. Wow. A couple of generations ago, you couldn't get Fruit Loops or potato chips or canned chili, Twinkies, and Spam and eat them all for dinner. I mean, we put all the meat and vegetables that we grow and all the meat and vegetables that we produce, we put them in this sort of processed blender so that it looks good on the shelf and we spit it out and, and all the good stuff is sucked right out of it in the process and it's filled with sugar and that's what we call processed foods. And I genuinely dislike McDonald's. I, I just do, but every once in a while, I get a, just, I want a Big Mac, you know? I don't know if you've ever, I mean, do you sin as well? So anyway, I, I just like, like God, and I saw so I sent Justin to the store, and I gave him some money. Hey, where are the big, will you get me a Big Mac? And so, and later that night, my stomach's all grumpy, and I'm all, uh, uh, what did I eat that stuff for? It's, it's terrible. You know that Good food heals us, according to nutritionists and some things I read. That's just the truth, friends. Healthy foods heal your body. And, and think about the way that God made food for us to eat. It has everything we need, right? Sugar, the invention of our last few generations, destroys the body and is, is antithetical toward health. It, it, and our foods are filled with it. Sugar has no benefit whatsoever for the body. I'm not talking about being legalistic or not enjoying Thanksgiving and having that piece of pecan pie with that big scoop of whipped cream on top. I'll just take another shot of insulin at night. But no, anyway, if you, if we, you know, I, I'm not talking about that, but, you know, but, but caffeine and, and, and flour and, and sugar, sugar specifically is crystals and it bangs against your body all in the inside and messes things up. But, but all these things that if we change the way we'd eat, maybe we would be healed. The way we eat changes our body's immunity. So what else gets us sick? Genetics and family history. My diabetes is caused because my pancreas doesn't secrete enough insulin for my body, but it was also in my grandfather and my mother as well. Heart disease, we know, dementia, Alzheimer's. The reason for this is because we live, as I said before, in a sin-sick, sin-filled, fallen world. We are subject in this world. Now, greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world, but we still sin, and we're still going to get sick. You're still going to get sick. You're still going to die. I find this thing, we fall, uh, or we, one generation allows in moderation, the next allows in excess. It's in everything, in the way we think, in the way we eat, in the things that we partake, partake in, the addictions that we have. But one generation allows a little of, the next will allow in excess. And hear this, that is always true unless the bloodline is broken. The reason that Jesus came and died was so that we would be under the bloodline of Abraham. Children of promise. And the different things in this world and this life can be broken by the power of God. And we're going to get there. But being in this sin-filled, sin-sick world introduces us to all kinds of inherited maladies and generational and, and genetic issues that run in the family and another reasons for sickness. And remember the disciples asking Jesus about this guy? Why is he? Why is he like this? Why? Because God's glory is going to be revealed. And we want to trust God with you today that his glory is going to be revealed. This next one I want to talk about is an interesting one because charismaniacs, we jump right to it. 
And I kind of lump myself in that evangelical world, absolutely. So demonic oppression. And in Luke's gospel, in Luke chapter uh, 13, I want to read from verse 11. And I, wanna, I just want us to get our head around this carefully. Um, let's read a verse 10. I don't think I have this on the screen, so I'm just going to read it for you, right from here. On a Sabbath, Jesus, forgive me, I, I don't have my new glasses yet. <clears throat> and I have to wear one two glasses ago because I broke the ones I had recently been wearing. So I can barely see the nose in front of my face. On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching one of the synagogues. And a woman who had been, woman there, <laughs> this is more difficult than I thought. I, said, I, I did it earlier, it was fine. Crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over, could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called to her, her forward. He called to her, notice that, and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Did she ask him for healing? Did she have great faith? We don't know, but Jesus healed her. Verse 13, because he always gets the glory, right? Because he's a loving father, and he's always working to draw people to salvation. That's a reason that he does anything. That's why miracles come. The difference between miracles and healing, and we'll get there. Woman, you're set free. When he put his hand on her, and immediately she straightened up and praised God. Indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. Oh, here we go again. The synagogue leaders said to the people, there are six days for work. So come and be healed in those six days, <clears throat> not on the Sabbath. <clears throat> As though this were something more commonplace happening by healers all the time. <laughs> no. Verse number, what is it? I can't see it. Okay, there we go. <laughs> the Lord answered him. <laughs> Talking about healing and we can't see the page in front of our face. The Lord answered him, you hypocrites, doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out uh, to give it water? Then why should this woman, daughter of Abraham, notice, a daughter of Abraham, the promise to Abraham is great. There's a lot of prophetic connection there. There's a lot of bloodline connection there with the promise of the grace and healing and power of salvation and, uh, that is in the Lord. Whom Satan, notice this, has kept bound for 18 long years. He set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her, when he said this, all his opponents were humiliated. Of course they would be. But the people were delighted with all the wonderful things he was doing. People are delighted when God does great things. Because God receives all the glory. Because he's a loving God. And he always does it to draw people closer to himself. And right here the Bible says that she was oppressed. Jesus identifies the significance of her condition, I want to be very careful here because the Bible is very clear, because there was a disabling spirit, it says. Some translations call it a spirit of infirmity. And this, this work of, on her was, was demonic. And we, we know that Christians are not demon-possessed. We know that the Spirit of God cannot inhabit the same space. Jesus said that, right? One or the other. It's not possible. But it does say that Christians can be oppressed by the enemy. And, and we've gone through this a lot before. But Acts 10.38 specifically says that Jesus went everywhere healing those who were oppressed by the devil. Paul writes in Ephesians 6.12 that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers of wickedness in high places. That there is an actual spirit. So what is the spirit of infirmity? Well, by this notion and this definition, we would say that the spirit of infirmity is, a, is when you never get well. When there's always one thing that goes on, then something else comes up in a chronic state of not being well, always sick, trauma as a child or, or in different ways. This is the work, uh, as Jesus says, and I believe, of the demonic. And we can't treat a demon, medicate a demon. You, you have to confront a demon. It's a different process. And sometimes there's the work of the demonic at work. And I, I think we have to acknowledge that. Now, <clears throat> there are some people that just don't get sick. Don't you love them? I mean, my sister got an award. I think she was the only one in many years that got an award in high school for never missing a day of school. 
my sister Amy. Now, of course, I took every chance I could get. I milked every situation possible, you know, just to get out of going to school. I didn't like school. Uh, but she got, she was, you know, perfect. But in, in genuineness, she she just was never ill. And, and our family was really blessed that way. We, we really never were that much, at, this, at least some Christians are at least too sick to be in church quite often, but that's another story. Um, listen, friends, I believe that you cannot be possessed by the demonic. I said that. But oppression is another matter, and Jesus came to set at liberty those oppressed by the enemy. And there are some chronic conditions I think we need to pray in Jesus' name that that be broken, and by his stripes and by his power, we are healed. Another reason is sin, a lack of spiritual covering. John 5.6 5, 6, 5, 6 says, this, this guy that we have right here, our character by the pool, um, I think we have to understand that we all walk in grace and not every time you sin you're going to get sick or suffer in some way. That's true, right? But we also know that we, we reap what we sow. And we also know that sin has repercussions. And when we're walking in rebellion to God, we come out from underneath his protection that he gives through his salvation. And we're, we're talking about being subject to things in the world. And it comes in, in many ways. And I, I don't claim to say that it happens every time, but God establishes the protection and the authorities in Scripture in our life for a reason. Let me tell you something, young people. The minute you step out from under the authority that God's given you and your parents, you are subject to the demonic world. When you, friend, adult, step out from the authorities that God has given you as well, you make yourself subject to all kinds of things. We may not like our bosses. We may, we may not care for this. We may not care for maybe some of our spiritual authorities. But if they're telling the truth, we make sure to stay in that place of protection. God establishes authorities in life. He establishes authorities in family structures. He establishes authority in governments. He establishes authority in church. It's like an umbrella covering. And when we get out from underneath it, the, the elements of the, of the sky fall on us, just like the elements of the world. We're supposed to submit to God's authority, and those that God gives in your life and my life are the ones that Satan wants to undermine and cause us to be rebellious against because we'll suffer in life. The young person can't see that their rebellion against their parents right now will ultimately lead them to the street homeless, helpless, and beat up and bruised and drug addicted. They don't recognize that that's going to... But those of us who are older, we've seen it a million times. Or we've been there ourselves. Right? We understand that. A lack, and I'll tell you what exactly what will happen, young person. And let me tell you, young... I don't, how many young people we got? Maybe like three. There's only a few here. Maybe some are watching online. I don't know. But as adults, I, I want to tell you this. And I know that there are a couple of our young people just came from youth conference. I will tell you exactly what will happen to you when you step out from under the authority and protection of your parents' grace, goodness, love, and God's protection. I will tell you exactly what's going to happen to you. I know exactly what will based on the counsel of God's words. You will suffer a lack of purpose. You will suffer depression. You will be sensually addicted. You'll be dr you possibly drug and alcohol addicted. You'll have anxiety and you will die. That's what will happen to you. Stay under the protection and authority of those that God has given you. In God's kingdom, you only have as much authority as you are under. Some don't believe this in the church today. They believe in, in a misguided way. They take it out of doctrine, and it's, it's a plethora on Christian television. This doctrine against the sovereignty of God drives me bananas. That somehow Adam gave up his uh, 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 dominion over the earth, to Satan, and now because we have to get permission, we have to give God permission to work in our lives. That's a bunch of malarkey. That's heresy. God designed our bodies to heal, friends. Healing and miracles are different. Healing is a process. We know this from how it looks. Miracles that Jesus performed healed, but they were instant. For some, you'll experience a miracle, and I believe in miracles, and I believe that God will touch you in those miracles even today. Some will experience a change in your life as God directs you. So how do we walk in our healing? Number one, forgiveness. In a practical way, we forgive and we're healed. We're healed from stress through forgiveness, right? Because we're walking in grace. This removes bitterness and stress. Luke 6, 35, 38. Love, forgive, give grace to. Jesus says that he will give you back as much grace as you give away. 
So when you do that, walk in forgiveness, it will be measured back to you. If you walk in judgment, unforgiveness, and lack of love, that will be measured to you because you're walking in rebellion. So forgiveness brings healing. We know that it does. The Bible says it over and over again throughout the Psalms, all the way through the Gospels. Everywhere you look, forgiveness brings healing. How many have forgiven somebody and you've uh, experienced a restoration in relationship? Amen. Number two, take care of our body. The temple of the Holy Spirit, the Bible calls it, specifically where God lives. Pray that, ask that God would change your desire. I know that that we suffer from struggles with the way that we eat and all these kinds of things. I am not outside of that struggle. I share it with you. Don't just be discouraged if you're not healed. Just follow through. If the same spirit that's in us, friends, rose Jesus from the grave, his spirit lives in us. Through the spiritual covering of the body of Christ, number three, Are you submitted to the body of Christ? James 5 tells us that we're supposed to call for the elders an illustration or God's gift to the church of leadership. We have elders in our church. That we submit to their blessing and authority in that way. We've erased this part of the church in contemporary church world. We've come just to experience worship a little bit and get excited about Jesus and then we don't get into the doctrine of God. So it's unfortunate. But the goodness of those leaders is to do what? provide a spiritual covering for you, to bless you, to encourage your faith, and to bring rebuke to you as well and correction. Part of the instruction to the church is that the leaders of the church would take spiritual authority for you and, and, and myself, and that they would, that they, you, we would go to them for prayer and that they would listen and, and, and heed their counsel and that we would respect their authority. And, and I know this is different to our world that disrespects authority, but friends, this is important. Number four, doctors and medicine. I've, I've experienced healing from this. Grateful for those who have ministered in this way. But God makes our bodies to heal, right? They just kind of help it in different directions. They know this. It is in their medical studies. They recognize that the body will do certain things if you just kind of give it permission here and there. Sometimes drugs, and that's something we have to be uh, careful of, okay? We can over-medicate in our culture. Fifth, prayer meditation on the word and confession. Psalm 107.20 says, He sent His word... And healed them. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So how do we get healed? Two things are really important. When we accepted Christ, for by grace you're saved, by grace alone, by God's goodness. Through faith. Through is important. It's not unimportant. I didn't mean for us to feel like it was unimportant last week, but through means I am changing my volition and my will away from the things that I see into the things that I know that God sees. I can't see them all. I don't claim to discern God's will at any moment all the time. I know it's revealed to me in certain ways by His Spirit, by His Word, and through providence, But the goodness of faith is that I am transitioning my confidence away from everything that I know in my flesh and my my carnal self, and I am investing it in the Lord. So by grace, I'm saved through that motion. Everybody here, if I were to say to you, for example, I want everybody here to raise your right hand. So would you please raise your right hand? Okay. Okay. Almost everybody did. You can put your hand down. It was a thought I had, and it was an idea for an illustration. But when I increased the thinking of it, I thought, well, what if my thought translated into some reaction? What if my faith, what if my thinking, excuse me, my thought, what if my thought came into this place where it actually did something? Well, it was very much something I did, because so it was volitional. In fact, everything that you did just now was volitional. You said, okay, pastor, I'll amuse you. I'll raise my hand. Okay, what's your point? My point is this. Changing my mind has no power over the things that are involuntary. It has no power over things that might be in my body causing a disease. My thinking doesn't translate into the things 
that I have no power over, only the volitionary actions I have. I, I can't think real hard, and I know some people through meditation can slow in their heartbeat, but I can't make my heart stop or my, myself to, you know, just quit breathing without passing out and I'll start breathing again. Those are involuntary things. Faith is saying, God, I am trusting you with everything that's involuntary. God, I am putting my confidence in you for everything that I can't possibly change. I am saying to you, Lord, my confidence is no longer in me to see my body healed. It is in you alone. And I am trusting you, God. God gets all the glory because he's a loving God to draw us closer to him. So we receive healing. That's how we do it. We receive it. For by grace, through faith. How did you get saved? You received it. We receive healing the same way. God gave himself. Isaiah 53. Jesus' blood. His sacrifice on the cross satisfies the healing. The rafa. To stitch by mending. He stitches us together. And secondly, faith is how do we get healed? We respond to God's sovereignty in faith. God is sovereign. The word is an expression of all that God is that we find in scripture and is evidenced in creation. It simply means that sovereign, the word means that God is the supreme ruler of all creation. And his supremacy is characterized by the fact that he has all, all authority, power, dominion, pleasure, and the right to all the grace and all the justice. He alone is worthy of this title. He is the one and only true sovereign. He is the one and only true supreme Leader, God wills whatever he desires by his character. He expresses it through his word to us and by the power of the Holy Spirit, sometimes even through the prophetic. And he enables us to gain hold of those promises and power through prayer. There's some in the church world today that says we're not supposed to pray for healing. But, but friends, we pray according to his will. The Bible says this over and over again. The Bible says, in fact, who knows the mind of the Lord that, that we can instruct him. But we have the mind of Christ. In the Old Testament, Isaiah says, you know, the, the, or Jeremiah says, how can the, he who is being made say to him who's making me, why are you making me like this? I, I don't know why my, this finger's longer than this one. Why did you do that, God? Why are you making me this way? The created can't say to the creator, why did you do this? It's, it's an impossible question. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dichotomy that can't exist. God is supreme commander, and, and we are the prayers. He is commander, supreme. We are the prayers, and the, the, we are the intercessors. We are the intercessors for what? His sovereign to reveal his healing power. Jesus told his disciples to what? Pray and not faint. Pray for the Lord of the harvest to send forth laborers. Love your enemies and pray for those that persecute you. Pray in times of trouble. Pray for one another to pray for our needs. Jesus says to believe and not doubt with real faith. 1 John 5.14, this is the confidence that we have before him, that if we ask anything according to what I want, he hears us. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, wait, that's the New American Standard. Maybe the New American Standard is wrong. Let's look in the King James. According to his will. Oh, wait. Let's try the NIV. His, according to his, oh, his will. Let's try the ESV. Oh, wait. He hears us. Why? According to his will. God is supreme leader, supreme commander. He can will whatever he wants. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we have asked from him. The confidence comes in, Lord, I'm willing to hear you say no. Lord, I'm willing to hear you say wait. And, and Lord, I'm willing to, say, to hear you say maybe in the next life. I've prayed for people and they've died. 
And I understand that they, because they were believers, they received the ultimate healing by God's will. Jesus doesn't take his usual direct approach with this guy, though, at the pool. He, he asks him, do you want to get well? Jesus implies that he may not want, get, want to get well. Or he may realize, as maybe some of, our right now, of us right now, that, that God in his sovereign, in his power, in all that he is and all that he wills, that, that we feel responsible somehow or guilty because we haven't been good enough for him to hear our cry. What are the reasons, friends, that you might give? You would think if, if you were at the hospital with IVs coming out of you everywhere and the bills piling up and Jesus says, do you want to get well? What would you say? Well, yeah, but this guy doesn't say that. I want to get at the heart of your condition and mine today, friend. What possible motivation would this guy have for not wanting to get well? Are you trusting in the Lord and all of his power? Are you putting your faith in him alone that he is sovereign? Here's, my, here's the power of the story with this guy. And I just want to say this because we are just like him. I'm a mess. He sits alone undeserving of healing. Jesus heals him. He sits broken. Jesus heals him. He whines and moans and complains. And Jesus heals him. He betrays Jesus in some way and Jesus heals him. He says, I don't know who healed me. He has opportunity to be healed, but stay where he is, but still Jesus heals him. He blames himself for not being able to move. He blames others for not helping him. He, he blames God for seeming to, to prefer others over him. Still Jesus heals him. Why does Jesus do this? Because, friends, he's not looking at your power or your ability to do anything. He's looking at you to come to him and say, Sovereign, Lord of creation, God of all, I receive from you your touch today. And I will hear your voice and heed your direction no matter what comes in life. Maybe today, this is the word we need to hear. You know, James 5 says, this is what we're going to embrace this morning. Verse 13, is any among you suffering? Let him pray. Let him pray. Is any among you cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who's sick and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. For every righteous person has great power as it is working. The goodness of God not only is that he is sovereign and above all, but he has given us this group of people right here that for one another, we trust God's word. We pray as Jesus has commanded us. We listen to the instruction of James to the church right here. And we participate in faith that our sovereign God will hear our cry for help. And he will meet us in our time of trouble. Maybe today our hope is broken. Our suffering is so long. Perhaps we've gotten to the place of rejection or attention. Maybe we've nearly given up hope. If you're living unhealthy, we want to pray that God would change your desires. If you have chronic sickness, we want to pray for deliverance from the oppressing thing that is on your life in the name of Jesus. Or maybe you just need a miracle today for God to touch you and bring healing by his power. That's what we want to do. We want to trust God and put it in his care and his hands. Thank you for watching Abundant Life Church. If you found this teaching helpful, please subscribe to our page and share us with a friend. Also, please consider giving at nwlife.org.